Good morning and welcome to today's Ask a Pro webinar. Today's topic is comparing powers of attorney and guardianships. My name is Chris Kimes and I will be your moderator for today's session. I'm the Director of Business Development here at the firm of Welton Weinberg & Reese. We're very excited to spend the next 45 minutes to an hour with you today. And I have to say, I'm so excited that there is close to 200 people registered for today's presentation. Thank you. I'd also like to thank you for all the questions that were provided upon the registration for today's session. We are gonna do our best to get to all of those today, and, and I think we'll get that done. Uh, before we move any further, I'd like to introduce the team. I'm so excited today to be joined by two talented individuals from our firm. The first being uh, Michelle Moore, who manages our probate team. Hi, Michelle. And the second being attorney Matt Pomey from our Pittsburgh office. Uh, before we get started, I would like to uh, share, take a moment to go over a few housekeeping items. As a reminder, this is an interactive session, so please submit your questions through the question button in the control panel. The questions will be addressed throughout the presentation when applicable. This webinar is being recorded, and at the conclusion of today's session, a link of the recording will be sent to all attendees. Lastly, there will be a short survey on your screen at the conclusion of the event, please take the survey and provide us your feedback. We really appreciate that, and we use that feedback to gear new presentations and topics that you'd like to hear about in the future. So being a law firm, we have to read our uh, legal disclaimer here, so allow me to do that. Uh, this presentation will provide information containing potential legal issues, concepts, factual situations, and information. This seminar and the materials provided is not a substitute for legal advice from qualified counsel on any matter, including similar or exact factual scenarios that may be provided or proposed. The presentation is not created or designed to attendees. The unique facts or circumstances that may arise in any specific instance that you should not and are not authorized to rely on the content as a source of legal advice. I would advise you to seek competent legal advice on these topics. This seminar and the seminar material does not create any attorney client partner, uh, I'm sorry, relationship between you and the law firm of Waltman Weinberg and Reese. Well, that's a mouthful. So let's get started. Uh, first question we'd like to go over today is setting the record straight and defining, you know, what is a power of attorney? So uh, Matt, you wanna kind of go over that one? Absolutely, thanks Chris. Hello everybody and good morning. I appreciate you being here with us today. Uh, this is a topic that uh, the more you get into it, the more complicated it is. Uh, so hopefully we can cover some of your uh, your bigger questions that you may have now and give you a stronger understanding of the, the legal framework uh, to help you with your understanding going forward. Uh, to do that, I think it's best to start with the basics here. Uh, so first we're going to start with what is a power of attorney at its base level. Uh, so a power of attorney essentially is a document that authorizes a person uh, otherwise known as an agent, to act on behalf of another person, also known as a principal. Uh, this establishes what's called a fiduciary relationship, essentially requiring the agent to act in the best interests of the principal whenever they choose to act. Um, there are a wide range of things that can be included in a power of attorney, uh, so you can kind of tailor to the document to fit exactly what the person needs uh, to cover everything that the, that the principal can do or just specific things that the principal wants the agent to be able to do. This will provide peace of mind to the principal, knowing that someone that they choose, that they trust, uh, is gonna be able to take certain actions on their behalf uh, should they be unable to, to do those things for whatever reason. Uh, it's important to know that these documents are generally not filed with the court systems. Uh, there are some exceptions to that, such as real estate transactions and things uh, similarly situated where you're going to want uh, the agency relationship to be recorded, uh, but that's in a rare situation. So, uh, you know, typically they're not filed with the courts. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. Um, so let's, now that we've kind of defined it, do you want to help us kind of define it a little bit more? Talk about the different types? Sure. So there's a, a few different types that, that we're going to cover today. I'm going to add in a couple things uh, beyond these uh, these ones listed on your slide here. Uh, the first 
type that we're going to talk about that we deal with most often is a durable power of attorney. Uh, this power of attorney is distinct because the agent remains authorized to act under the power of attorney even after the principal becomes incapacitated. Uh, so long as the principal has the capacity to sign the power of attorney at the time that they signed it, uh, the power of attorney is going to remain in effect even if that principal eventually becomes incapacitated. Uh, most power of attorneys are, are structured like this, uh, so it's probably the most common one you'll see. Uh, but then another side to that same coin uh, is not on your slide, but it's referred to as a springing power of attorney. Uh, this document's one that is going to go into effect uh, once the principal becomes incapacitated. Uh, so they'll have language within the document that will say when the power of attorney is going to be triggered. It's going to define where uh, uh, that agent is going to be able to step into the shoes of the of the principal once they become incapacitated to act on their behalf. So it's just sort of two sides of the same coin there. Another power of attorney we're going to cover is a financial power of attorney. So obviously, like the name suggests, uh, the, this power of attorney is going to cover financial uh, financial decisions of the principal. Uh, so this is where the principal gives the agent the authority to act on bank accounts, on uh, business transactions, things like that. And that's all going to be spelled out within the power of attorney document itself. Uh, so if the principal has, for example, a, a brother that is a financial advisor and a sister who is a doctor, they can authorize the brother uh, under a financial power of attorney uh, to make those financial decisions. And as you can see in the next one, uh, they can authorize the sister as the medical power of attorney to use her expertise to, to address any medical needs that may be, <clears throat> that may come up for the principal uh, while that power of attorney is in effect. Um, another power of attorney that's not on the screen, but I do always like to mention because it does get uh, a little bit of a hot button issue and it does uh, cause a lot of questions a lot of the times. It's a military power of attorney. These power of attorneys are exempt from most uh, form and substance requirements in, in most states. Uh, it'll say on the document that it is a military power of attorney, and it will say it's exempt from these rules. Uh, but there are other things that you're going to have to make sure uh, that you note. Um, the statute gets a little bit complicated, uh, but for your purposes today, probably best just to understand that if you do get presented with a power of attorney that's structured in that way, it's probably best to escalate that to uh, to an attorney who's more familiar with the idiosyncrasies of that law uh, to make sure that that power of attorney is going to be good. Um, so just to review uh, the primary types of powers of attorney we're going to discuss today, we're going to go through durable powers of attorney, which uh, continue granting uh, authorization to the agent after the principal becomes incapacitated. Uh, financial powers of attorney, which cover financial matters and monetary issues for the principal and medical powers of attorney, which are going to cover medical decisions of the principal. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. That's a lot of information. I know we're going to cover that in a little bit more detail later. So uh, I have seen a couple of questions come through, but we'll we'll pick up those uh, later. Let's, let's transition over to you, Michelle. Um, let's talk a little bit about guardianships. Same exercise. Let's kind of define, you know, what a guardianship is. Go ahead, Michelle. Sure. Sure. Thanks, Chris. And thank you, everyone, for participating today and joining us in regards to our webinar. I'm going to talk about guardianships. Um, it's a legal process that's used to protect individuals that don't have the ability to either take care of themselves. They could be incapacitated, disabled, or an elderly parent that needs some help in making decisions. Um, this is a court-appointed position. You do have to file with the probate court to be a guardian. Uh, there could be at times that you have to go through some type of training also to qualify as a guardian. And legal guardians have the authority to make decisions for the ward. The person's called the ward. And there are several different types of guardianships that we are going to talk about. And uh, so it just depends on what that individual person needs at that time is the type of guardianship that will be appointed. Great, thank you. And um, again, like we did with uh, Matt, do you want to kind of talk about the different types of guardianships, please? Sure. So there's several different types of guardianships. The first one we're going to talk about is the limited guardianship. And this basically could be for a short period of time. It's for a specific reason. And it could be for any um, a medical decision or 
anything that is needed maybe in a court uh, litigation. So just something that's short term. And then once that is completed, then the guardianship is, is done. It's all, there's no reason for the uh, ward to have a guardian. So it's for a limited time, meaning the limited guardianship. A guardianship of the person is basically for their day-to-day -day, uh, needs, either for uh, per all personal nature in regards to, um, could be food, it could be clothing, residence, medical care, recreation, education, could be uh, anything to do with their person. And they only have the ability to have control over the over the day-to-day -day responsibilities for that person, no financial obligations. Um, and the guardianship will continue until the ward passes away or maybe the court determines that the ward is okay and can now take care of themselves. So in, during this time for the guardianship of the person, the court wants to make sure and receive progress of that ward. So they have to file with the probate court what's called um, a guardian's report. So basically that guardian will let the court know how things are progressing, how the ward's doing, are they getting better, are they getting worse, do they need to continue with a guardianship and, and so on. So then at that point, the court will decide, uh, depending on the guardian's report, if they need to continue. Um, guardianship of the estate, which is financial, so any financial needs of the ward, this person would take care of their assets, their income, their property, um, anything to do with, with their financial needs for the ward. And also like the personal guardianship, there is also accountings that have to be filed with the probate court to show them where's the money going. So then the, uh, the guardian cannot just take money and say, oh, I can just write it off and put it somewhere else. So the court wants to see where did the finances go? Where did this checking account go or savings or the property? So they have to be accountable for all the things that they're spending the money on to take care of that ward. Plenary guardianship. This is a fancy word I call it to, for both person and estate. So this person has the authority over the ward for their personal needs and their financial needs. So they do both. Uh, there's also a guardian ad litem, and you see this more so with maybe like divorce cases or some type of litigation, usually for minor children, there'll be a guardian ad litem awarded to them to make sure that a guardian, to, to make sure that everything is being watched over for that minor child. And also it could be maybe for an elderly person for some type of litigation or someone that isn't able to present themselves, they'll be appointed a guardian ad litem. And then once that litigation ends, then that guardian ad litem is, is completed. It's all, it's done. But overall, I mean, the probate court is the superior guardian, what we call it, because um, all guardians must follow what the court is asking. Uh, they must file their annual reports and their accountings through the court. So we've talked about several different types of guardianships, a limited guardianship, which is limited time for a specific reason. The person is for the day-to-day -day decisions. The estate is for financial, their assets, money, and property. Their person and estate, so you can do day-to-day -day and your assets, financial. And then a guardian ad litem, which is in regards to litigation purposes or divorces. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, we do have a couple questions coming in, so I'm going to uh, take a breather here and review this one. Matt, this is actually for you. Um, if somebody has a durable power of attorney, can the language still allow for the agent to do banking slash financial transactions? Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. So we'll get this in, into a little bit more of this here in a couple slides, I think. Uh, but ultimately, uh, most questions regarding a power of attorney is going to come down to the language in the document. Um, so if the if the particular power of attorney does spell out uh, that it, it does survive incapacitation and it is a durable power of attorney, and it also lists that the agent is going to be authorized to do those sorts of banking transactions, uh, then you know you just come back to the document and you say is this a valid power of attorney that transfers these powers effectively and if so e even after incapacitation that power of attorney is going to be valid uh, for uh, uh, for financial transactions 
Yeah, thank you, Matt. And I know we are going to get a little bit more into that here in a little bit. I would like to mention, we've had a few questions coming about obtaining a copy of the presentation. You will be receiving um, a copy of the presentation along with the recording uh, at the conclusion, just so you're aware. So thank you for that. Okay, so now that we've uh, talked about the different types, I think uh, we should probably transition into talking about what are the uh, advantages and disadvantages of each. Um, and I know this is going to get some questions, so uh, I'll keep an eye on that uh, that question toolbar. So, Matt, uh, you want to start with you, and we'll kind of go over some uh, of the uh, power of attorneys, please. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, the really the advantages and even the drawbacks from power of attorneys lie in their relative informality. Um, so, they they are sort of an informal document. They're they're easy to draft. Pretty much anybody can do it. You can find copy or you can find uh, examples online that are going to be uh, sufficient. Uh, they they can grant broad powers to your agent uh, also very easily. Um, so when you draft uh, when you draft this document, you're able to uh, essentially pick and choose which powers you you're allowing the agent to undertake on your behalf. Um, so that that level of informality can be good. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, there's very little oversight as to agency, a, the agent's activity. Um, so, you know, because there's no court involvement to make sure the agent's acting uh, in the in the principal's best interest, there's a, a, a good amount of risk involved and, and things can go very wrong um, in terms of uh, an agent potentially taking advantage of a principal. And it's entirely on uh, the principal and, and their family potentially to make sure that isn't happening. Um, <clears throat> so you can think about uh, a, a situation where where an agent is uh, is taking advantage of a, a of a principal. They're they're going in there taking out uh, money from their from their bank accounts, even if it's authorized um, in the power of attorney document. They're able to do that. They're still needing to use that money for the benefit of the principal, and there's just nobody. Uh, Nobody making sure that happens at the outset. Uh, so it's really a back end review uh, on the principal's part. Um, additionally, uh, e even though they're easy to draft and they can grant broad powers, they do require competency at the time of signing uh, to be effective. That's not necessarily uh, an institution's uh, prerogative to make sure that's going to be covered with a notary stamp and everything like that. Uh, but you can think about a situation where competency is an issue uh, that may pr pose problems. Um, I recall a situation at my last job uh, where we were attempting to help a, an individual with a, a recent Parkinson's diagnosis draft estate planning documents. Uh, she would have periods of lucidity where she would be able to have extensive conversations about her finances and, and her past in, in endeavors, but some days she, she just wouldn't be able to hold a conversation for, for one reason or another. Uh, we had two appointments with her to come in and try to establish the competency level to sign those documents. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to do that uh, during our appointments, and so the family ended up needing to institute a guardianship proceeding over her uh, because she couldn't demonstrate that competency level at the time of uh, at the time of signing. Uh, so that can be a, a pretty significant uh, drawback to powers of attorney. <clears throat> uh, powers of attorney are also easy to revoke. Um, so a power of attorney is uh, terminated when the principal dies. Uh, when it when they become incapacitated if the power of attorney is not durable uh, when the principal formally revokes a power of attorney in writing uh, or the power of attorney can even provide for its own termination uh, within the terms of the document and so i mentioned before where powers of attorney to transfer uh, uh, real estate uh, would need to be recorded at, uh, before a closing can take place uh, these are pretty common powers of attorney to uh, to provide for their own termination. So once once the real once the real estate is transferred, the power of attorney could then provide for its own revocation. Um, however, because it's recorded, any power of attorney that's recorded uh, is going to need to have that revocation also recorded before the revocation becomes effective. Uh, <clears throat> so. And that sort of uh, power of attorney that's going to provide for its own revocation is called the limited power of attorney. Uh, and that gets a little bit into the weeds, but essentially what that means is uh, it's only for a limited purpose. Uh, and once that purpose is fulfilled, 
uh, the power of attorney essentially provides uh, in itself for uh, its own revocation and then it would be no longer operative. Uh, so those are just a, a little bit of a, a sliding scale of benefits and disadvantages for powers of attorney. Thanks, Matt. So uh, we've had a couple more questions come in and sticking with you, Matt, um, I'd like to ask you this one. Um, are there government agencies that do not accept durable or financial powers of attorneys, you know, such as SSA or the IRS? Yeah, they're, they're going to be um, different agencies have different levels of um, I'm trying to think of the best way to word this uh, uh, on the hoops that they require uh, different people to jump through. Um, I know Social Security is very picky in terms of what documentation they they allow to uh, to take direction from. Uh, typically, Social Security will require um, uh, payee notices and payee designations for uh, anyone in control of finances that are receiving public benefits. Um, so, typically, the general rule that I follow is. You know, whatever agency you're dealing with, just you're just going to have to sort of white knuckle through it and just uh, cooperate with whatever uh, demands they're making. Um, I know payee accounts can be uh, particularly <clears throat> difficult, though they often come with powers of attorney, um, just for ease of uh, of uh, disclosures and, and certain things when the account's set up. Um, but you know, each agency is going to be different, and it could even be different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, so um, there's a couple more coming in. I'm going to stick with you, Matt, again here. Um, so, Michelle, we'll get back to you. Don't you worry. We'll be there. Um, so, Matt, um, if a principal wants to revoke the power of attorney, you know, will he or she, will, will they need to provide the financial institution with something in writing? Yes, so typically the revocation is going to be required to be in writing. Uh, or at least your institution is probably best requiring it to be uh, offered in writing, and that's just to fulfill or to to fill out your particular file. So if you have a power of attorney for uh, patient X or or, or uh, uh, consumer X, then you're going to want to continue to document that file if the power of attorney is re revoked, just so everyone's on the same page. So if you have a power of attorney in file and the principal is attempting to revoke it, just have them sign it, notarize it, get it to you, and then have that uh, file complete so that everybody in your institution knows uh, that that particular power of attorney has been revoked. And just, just keeping a paper trail uh, can really protect your institution going forward. Great. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, Michelle, we're going to move on to you. I, there's a couple other questions here I'll get through uh, in just a minute, and we'll come back maybe to you, Matt. So you can take, you have a glass of water now. <laughs> Let's talk about guardianships. Uh, Michelle, if you don't mind, uh, you want to talk about advantages and disadvantages there, please? Sure, sure. Um, one of the advantages is it's clear who the guardian is and what their purpose is, why, they're, why they are the guardian. It's specified in the documents. Um, you do have to go through the probate court. It is a filing, so some people could look at that as a disadvantage. And then, like I said earlier, there are training that the guardian has to go through to make sure that they're able to uh, handle being a guardian in regards to the ward. So they do have to go through some type of training um, through the probate court. Uh, the probate court, as we talked about earlier, they do want accountings from the guardians. They want uh, the, the person for the guard they want accountability in regards to the inventories and the guardian report so that's always a plus and the war the guardian cannot take advantage of the ward because they're filing things with the court and then the court's monitoring all of that and the guardian is the guardian until the person passes away or it's determined that the ward no longer needs a guardian so it could be quite some time while you're the guardian for that person the court, again, does oversee all of that, um, and it is difficult to remove a guardian from a ward unless they pass. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question that came in, Matt, um, that I think is going to kind of play into um, where we're transitioning now. So um, before we get into how do you verify powers of attorney and what documentation is needed, a question came in. 
they talked about the the competency. So who is determining, Matt, this is for you, who is determining the competency of the client with the power of attorney signing? Is it the notary? Who would, uh, who, who would do who would, who determines that? It's a little bit of a, a of a collaborative effort in my experience. Uh, so when I was doing more state drafting work, it would be a, a combination of, of me as the attorney conducting the, the initial client interview, um, kind of trying to make sure that uh, we hit all the basis of basis of competency just in case the question comes in later. Um, but then additionally, it is a, a, a requirement for the notary to make sure that they believe that the, the individual is uh, competent for signing. Um, it's not, again, not necessarily on the institution to make that determination. Uh, it's really just something to keep in mind when you're when you're presented with a power of attorney. Uh, and we'll go into this a little bit later, uh, but you're gonna make sure you wanna note when, what the date on that power of attorney is, uh, because that's potentially when it's gonna need to be determined whether or not that individual is competent. Uh, if a question arises, comes up later about that, uh, your institution is going to want to have that information in the file uh, just in case uh, it, it ever becomes relevant if a question is presented in the future. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a, that makes sense, actually. Um, Matt, I'm just going to ask you one more here. Um, so can a financial institution allow the principal to continue to do transactions on his or her own behalf when a power of attorney is on file? Uh, yeah, so that's actually, I think I may have missed that in my notes. So that's actually a, a, a benefit of powers of attorney. Uh, so when the principal provides uh, an agent with authority to act, they do not lose the authority to act on their own. Um, so that's a, a distinction from guardianships as well. Uh, because if an individual uh, goes in and executes a power of attorney for agent X uh, to transact business on their behalf, they can still go into a, a financial institution uh, and, and direct their own finances. Uh, so it's important to know that the, the principal in, in any situation isn't giving up their, uh, their ability to make determinations on their own. Uh, they're essentially just adding someone else uh, who's able to come in and step into their shoes to, to make those sorts of decisions. Uh, but if they choose and are able, they can still come in and do those, those same things for themselves. So, uh, building on that a little bit, so is a financial institution required to accept and honor a power of attorney? Um, ultimately, that's going to come down to, to each individual institution, unfortunately. Um, if they have some reason to suspect that it's it, it's not valid or it's, it's fraudulent, there's you know certainly steps that the institution can take on, on that basis. Um, but you know, I think it, it, it's a better general rule. Uh, to go ahead and honor a power of attorney if it's valid, if it goes through your your processes internally, uh, and, and you've determined that it's a valid power of attorney to transfer that authority to an agent, it's probably best to go ahead and uh, you know go with that power of attorney, unless there are you know obviously extenuating circumstances that can always get uh, more complicated than than what we can probably address here today. <laughs> Right. And I told you you'd be very popular today, by the way, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> I have another one for you. You ready? Um, sure. If a principal gives a power of attorney to an LLC, can the employee of that LLC act on their behalf? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, well, ultimately, I, I always come back to questions on power of attorney coming back to the document. Um, so, you know, whatever the, the, the power of attorney document says is going to control. Um, so if it is, you know, the, the owner and president of the LLC, um, providing a power of attorney generally for, uh, you know, agents of that particular, uh, corporate entity, uh, to make decisions on their behalf, um, you know, that would be one review that, that you could possibly do again, that gets into, into the weeds a little bit, because it's also going to be uh, relevant how that corporation is structured uh, and who the particular employee is within the corporation um, or, or the, uh, the the LLC, however that's structured, uh, is, is going to come into play as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, 
I would unfortunately have to rest on, you know, coming back to the document and coming back to how that that corporate entity is is structured. Um, but but I could certainly see a situation where those documents are, you know, drafted contemplating that activity uh, and would be able to specify um, to specify that it would be authorized. Uh, but it would come back to those documents. Comes back to the documents. Yep. So just uh, the, this wasn't a question, just more of a comment that I'm sure many out there, based on you know those I know who are registered for today. Um, speaking of competency, it's just here's a, you know just a comment from someone. It's it's very difficult when they come into the nursing home and the family is fighting between themselves for the competency. I mean, I, I completely understand. I'm sure that's very challenging. Very challenging. Sorry, I have to go through that. That's for sure. Um, so, uh, Matt, let's let's go ahead and go into um, you know how do you verify powers of attorney? What documentation is needed? I think we've covered a little bit of that kind of through the questions, but let, let's go there. Absolutely. Uh, so, just at the outset, um, I'm going to focus on uh, the laws in Pennsylvania and Ohio. Uh, that's primarily where where I practice and where where we practice really, uh, but uh, it's it's important to know that many jurisdictions have uh, slightly different but similar requirements. Um, and Pennsylvania and Ohio are uh, actually two states that ascribe to um, uh, to the what's called the Uniform Power of Attorney Act. Uh, so that's a, a, a an endeavor by many states to kind of uh, make make their power of attorney laws uh, go one go hand in hand or, or be as similar as possible to each other uh, to make make it easier for agents under power of attorney moving from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, so Pennsylvania and Ohio and other signatories to the Uniform Power of Attorney Act uh, are going to be substantially similar. Um, but if you are presented with uh, a power of attorney outside uh, your state, there are also statutes about what out-of-state power of attorneys have to comply with in-state uh, to go forward. Uh, but I think for today's purposes, it's best just to know if you have uh, your in-state requirements um, set, uh, you know, follow that for in-state powers of attorney. If you're presented with a foreign power of attorney, uh, probably best to escalate that to make sure someone can get their eyes on that. Uh, and review the foreign power of attorney on that uh, on the basis of the foreign power of attorney statute. <clears throat> uh, but in general, uh, the principal for under a power of attorney must be at least 18 years old. Uh, they must have the capacity to sign on their own. Uh, and in general, the signature has to be notarized. Um, so for capacity, typically the the elements that that we're looking for, and again, not necessarily on the on the burden on the institution, but just in, but just for your general knowledge, uh, they have to understand the meaning of the document. They have to understand the scope and the nature of their assets, and they have to understand the risks and the benefits of signing the document. So that's what uh, these estate planning drafters are, are looking for uh, at the time when the power of attorney is drafted. <clears throat> uh, so when this, with a medical power of attorney though, uh, that must be the document must be signed and it must be witnessed uh, by someone who's not an agent. So it's a little bit of a of a wrinkle there. Uh, so there there's a statutory template uh, that's generally acceptable. Uh, you can find that on either Ohio or uh, Pennsylvania statutory website. Um, and when you look at that document, you'll see uh, it's a pretty extensive document and there's a lot of blanks and fill-ins for people to use. Uh, so it, POAs can really come in a variety of different forms, uh, like I said, because of their informality. Uh, so you'll, you will you can even see powers of attorney with check boxes uh, for certain authorities that they want to transfer to the agent. Um, and you'll see basically the principal just filling their name in a box uh, and then Xing, you know, transact business on behalf of myself with banks, with uh, real estate, with such and such. And then they'll have other check boxes for things they don't want them to do. Um, so <clears throat> when you're going through, when you're presented with a power of attorney document, it's important to go through this checklist here uh, and note in your file so that you have all this information at the ready should it become relevant in the future. Uh, so you want to note who the agent is. Uh, is their successor agent named? Uh, because that successor may end up being the agent who's eventually acting 
Uh, you want to note when the power of attorney was signed. You want to note the specific powers that are granted, uh, if it is a specific power of attorney uh, that uh, you know picks and choose what, what authority is going to be transferred over. You want to note if the power of attorney is conditional in any way, like we talked about a springing power of attorney, if it only comes into play if the uh, principal is incapacitated. Uh, you want to note if there's anything specifically prohibited. So you want to pull that out of the document uh, so your institution has that at the ready uh, if an agent uh, comes in and tries to act on that power of attorney. And you want to note specifically whether or not there's that durable language in there uh, to make sure you know whether or not that document's going to stay in effect if the, the principal eventually becomes incapacitated. Uh, so long as you receive the power of attorney and you go through your steps to make sure that it's uh, it conforms to the applicable laws in your, your jurisdiction, uh, your institution is going to be justified in relying on the directions of that agent uh, to act on behalf of the principal. Uh, so this is really a process that's going to protect your institution as you move forward. Uh, so it's in your best interest to make sure uh, you know, you have this information at the ready uh, should it eventually become relevant. Yeah, thanks, Matt. I appreciate that. So we've got about 20 minutes left. There's uh, some questions here coming in. I'll uh, hold some of these so we can get through the questions that were asked at the uh, during the registration process. So um, let's uh, let's move on to this question. So uh, how do you uh, how do you verify guardianships and what documentation is needed? Michelle, you want to help us there? Sure, yeah. So when you um, have someone that brings in a guardianship papers, you can always check the probate court that it was filed in. So that's nice. You can check the docket just to verify that that is where that there is a guardianship and you can look at that wherever the ward county the ward lived in lives in. Um, the guardian should have what's called letters of guardianship. And they would be signed and there would be a raised seal on it. So you can feel the raised seal and they last for 16 months. So after 16 months, they expire. So you want to make sure you're looking at that date to make sure that the guardian, the letters of guardianship are still valid. Um, look to see what type of guardianship it is. Is it limited, person, estate, both? Um, so you want to make sure you're... So same like with uh, Matt was saying, you want to make sure you're giving the right information to that guardian, depending on what type of guardianship it is. Uh, you also want to look too to see if there is a successor guardian. There could be someone that's handling their financial affairs, someone that's handling the person. So they could have two different people in regards to the guardianship also. And uh, so you just want to make sure you're verifying with the courts that the guardianship has been filed, that the letters of the guardianship are embossed with a raised seal, who is the guardian and, and what are their responsibilities? How are they listed as the guardian? What is the date of the guardianship? And what authority does that guardianship have over the ward, either limited person, estate, or both? Thank you, Michelle. Um, before we go into question eight here, I did get a question here, um, <clears throat> and Michelle, this might be for you, but how can you get an expedited emergency guardian? Do you know how that process works and, and maybe how long that kind of takes? I honestly don't, but I mean, you would still have to go through the probate court. You'd have to go, I would, I'm assuming Matt, right? You'd have to try to expedite it through the courts, maybe because of the situation, they could push it through faster, but I'm, I'm honestly not too sure on that. Yeah, I would echo that as well, uh, Michelle. I think, I think you're right there. If, if the court has a process for uh, hearing those things as on an emergency basis, um, that's something that, uh, you know, you could be able to do. Um, obviously there's gonna be separate, separate jurisdictions with, with, with their own rules, on how to go about that. Um, so again, you're gonna be sort of at the mercy of whatever jurisdiction you're in. Um, but assuming they have some sort of uh, emergency motion uh, mechanism in the court, you, you'd theoretically be able to go through that process. Um, but it, I, I imagine it would still be, you know, probably longer than anyone wants. Right. <laughs> Always yeah. is, right? <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Nothing Matt. Nothing fast through the courts. It, it, no, right. Um, Matt, is a a living will considered the same as a medical power of attorney? Um, I mean, I think yes and no. Um, 
to me at least, uh, it, when you're talking about a living will, it's it's really more of an, an advanced directive in my mind. Um, but I mean, if you if you treat a living will like a power of attorney, <clears throat> it, it's going to essentially have the same outcome. Um, so it may be a distinction without a difference because um, a, a living will is going to still need to be witnessed um, and and, uh, and things like that. And if it is essentially an advanced healthcare directive that that's going to uh, empower someone to act on behalf of of uh, an incapacitated individual. It's essentially operating as a power of attorney if it's not, you know, just named that way. Um, so yeah, for, for for what it's worth, I, I I don't see that much of a difference between them, um, but um, but technically, I guess there is it, it is a slight difference. But uh, as long as the the particular requirements in your just jurisdiction are met for either of them, you'll be fine going forward with however you term it. Thanks, Michelle, this is for you. Um, if the letter of guardianship expires in 16 months, does it require um, us to get updated guardianship letters after the time has lapsed? Yeah, so the guardian will have to renew that with the probate court. They'll have to go back and renew the guardianship and then have new letters of guardian ship with that new date and seal. So they would have to definitely bring in new papers to show that they're still the guardian. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to keep these, keep, I'm, I'm trying to get your questions answered out there, everyone. I really appreciate you sending them. So um, I'll look at some of these while we go over the next one. So what are the restrictions on the different types of powers of attorney and guardianships? I think uh, maybe both, both might wanna chime in on this one. Yeah, absolutely. So, so like I said a couple of times, uh, much of the restrictions uh, surrounding a power of attorney is going to come back to the document. Um, so you're really going to want to uh, keep that document handy, keep your notes on the document handy, make sure you have all of those uh, things from a couple slides ago uh, listed out in your file so you have that information at the ready. Um, <clears throat> so, it, when you're dealing with uh, with a power of attorney, there are certain restrictions that can be placed in the document. So you want to have that uh, you want to have that in mind while you review it. Um, so a power of attorney, for example, can uh, transfer the or can give the right of the agent to sell stock, but potentially not transact business in real estate. Uh, so, for example, uh, if an individual uh, grants a power of attorney to, for example, their grandson. Uh, and directs their grandson to give five thousand dollars to each to themselves and each other grandchild. Um, you want to review the power of attorney uh, to make sure that they're authorized to do that. Uh, so if the power of attorney lists out that the agent is allowed to allowed to withdraw funds from uh, principal the principal's financial institutions and their their banking accounts, uh, then that would be fine. But if the power of attorney also uh, uh, prevents the the agent from taking any action that would incur uh, additional tax liability on behalf of the principal then that's a little bit more of a gray area because that is a, uh, incurring tax liability <clears throat> uh, for that principal uh, so it's a little bit of a, a of a gray area where you're going to want to come back to the document and make sure uh, that whatever you're presented with uh, is authorizing the agent to take that particular activity uh, so if you're presented with that power of attorney that says this agent is allowed to withdraw funds uh, but not allowed to self-deal or not allowed to uh, do one thing or another uh, you're going to want to make sure that that you keep that in mind uh, when you're reviewing the action of the agent. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it, ultimately most of the restrictions for powers of attorney are going to come back to that fiduciary relationship uh, and unfortunately, with powers of attorney, like we've discussed, uh, there's not that same oversight mechanism like with guardianships. So much of the, the restrictions are sort of passive restrictions on that fiduciary relationship that are only going to come into play later uh, if a question is raised about an, uh, about an agent's particular activity. Uh, so again, ultimately, it's going to be best to uh, keep that controlling document close um, make sure every time an agent is attempting to take any action that you review that action against that document uh, and make sure whatever they're trying to do uh, is justified within the document. Um, and, and that's really going to protect the, your institution 
if any question in the future comes up uh, about that agent's activity, because you're going to be able to point in your file to, oh, well, we reviewed the power of attorney here uh, when the agent came in and tried to do X. We looked at the document. We saw they were allowed to do X, so we let them do it. Uh, that's going to protect your financial institution should the, the principal's family or anyone else attempt to question the agent's actions later. Um, so you just want to make sure that that you're authorized to to take that action on behalf or on the direction of the agent. And and then with the guardianships, I mean, you're already restricted depending on if it's for the person, for their estate, or for both. So again, like Matt saying, look at the document. What type of guardianship is it? If it's for a person, then they're only handling day to day. If it's a state, it's only financial. So if someone that's a guardianship for their person comes in for a financial um, need, then that person can't handle that. So you just need to make sure you are looking at that document to make sure what they're requesting and doing, they're allowed to. Which makes sense. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Um, got a couple other questions here. I'm going to let uh, the two of you decide maybe who wants to take a swing at this one. But what is the risk to a creditor if they continue to work directly with a principal under the guardianship? That's a good question. What type of guardianship? <laughs> well, they didn't give me that piece. <laughs> <laughs> I think in general, I, I, you know, well, there... I'm, guess, yeah. I'm guessing with the creditor, it would be financial. Um, so if they're the guardian for the finances, I would think that they could not work with them, Matt, am I right? They shouldn't, if there's a guardianship or financial for the ward, they shouldn't work with the ward because they have a guardian, because they don't have the ability to handle their finances. Yeah, that, that's likely how it would shake out, Michelle. I, I think your instincts are right there. Um, when, uh, when a guardianship is instituted uh, uh, over an individual, they lose their uh, ability to, to, to make those decisions that are covered by the guardianship. Um, so the guardian is going to assume that role for uh, the ward and make decisions on their behalf. Um, so that ward's going to lose the ability to make decisions in regards to you know, whatever the, the court determined that the guardian should be in charge of. Um, so it, it really, it's it's best to keep that in mind. That's it's probably the best way to think about it. Is is a court has made a determination that this ward is no longer able to make these sorts of decisions. Um, so that's going to come. That's going to be transferred over to the guardian after that uh, a, after that guardianship proceeding is instituted. Got it. Um, so I had a feeling this one would come up. So um, before we go to the next question, so. Um, how should the financial institution handle family disputes where some of the family claims that the principal was incapacitated when the documents were signed? Any, any thoughts there? So they're claiming that the, uh, the individual was uh, incapacitated when they signed the documents. So just how, how I'm sort of contextualizing the question, I, I, I'm thinking, you know, uh, 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 the principal is the primary cu customer or uh, uh, contact for the institution and then you have warring families so probably uh, uh you know one side of the family wanted to do a certain action and the other side said no uh, this agent is not able to do this because the power of attorney is inoperative essentially um so in, in that sort of context again i'd come back to the document um, so, you know, whatever your uh, institution is, uh, you know, whatever their processes is for reviewing powers of attorney, um, you know, go through those processes, make sure everything in your file is complete, go through that checklist that we talked about for the power of attorney when you're reviewing it. Um, and if, if your processes determine that that power of attorney is valid, um, you're going to be justified in taking action from the agent, uh, regardless of whatever the other family's claiming. Um, that's that's going to be, like I said, on the family to prevent or to to essentially protect the principal or to enforce the fiduciary relationship uh, at a later date. Um, so that's not necessarily something that your institution's going to need to get involved with. Um, <clears throat> but it would be best if you know that that's a potential controversy or potential issue that's going to come up. It's going to mean that you're going to definitely want to paper that file a little more. Um, so make sure you have the power of attorney document. Potentially ask the agent or the principal or if they are uh, if they do have the capacity 
to provide extra signatures for certain actions that they're taking. Uh, if an agent in this situation is coming in asking to uh, withdraw significant amounts of money, um, have them sign something that they're doing that request under the power of attorney. Um, have them sign that, you know, they, they're doing this at the request of the power of attorney or for the best interest of the power of attorney. Um, you know, something along those lines uh, to, to continue to protect your institution going forward since you know this possible legal issue uh, is likely to come up later. Um, so that's more of a question of, you know, papering the file just in case the, that uh, a controversy arises later. Gotcha. Um, thank you, Matt. So um, <clears throat> there's been several questions regarding um, if, um, well, let's start with this. Matt, you keep saying the same thing over and over. Come back to the documents. Come back to the document, right? Um, there's been a lot of questions to uh, asking if um, there be the ability for um, Matt or anyone on our team to review um, your uh, current process policies regarding guardianships and powers of attorney. Um, that actually is a survey question at the end that you can answer to. If you'd like to have a follow-up there, we'd be happy to do that. So for those of you who've been asking, the answer is yes. Um, and on the survey at the end, which is coming up soon, you can uh, click yes and we can reach you. Um, so Matt, let, so what happens to the power of attorney or Michelle and guardianship when they pass away? So the, the power of attorney side of this is going to be very easy. Um, once the principal passes away, that power of attorney is gone. Um, it ends the power of attorney. Um, it becomes essentially inoperative and the agent cannot act based on that power of attorney. Um, this is true even if that agent is named as the executor in the principal's will. Um, it's true no matter what, that power of attorney is going to go away. Um, I, I do feel quite a bit of calls on this question from, from many credit unions in our area. Um, and, you know, not long ago, I got a call from a credit union where a, a former power of attorney was coming into a branch. Uh, their principal just died. Uh, they're the named executor and they want to come get money out of that individual's account to pay the funeral bill. Um, the credit union wanted to know if they could they could honor that request from the power of attorney. And I had to tell them, no, uh, that power of attorney died with the principal. Um, they, they're going to have to turn that, uh, former power, the former agent, uh, now named executor, uh, away until they go and get, uh, you know, officially appointed as the executor <clears throat> in that situation to step in the shoes of the estate, uh, and then request those funds. Um, so important to note when the power, when the principal dies, that power of attorney is gone. And, and with the guardianship, the power, the guardianship is also um, uh, discharged or terminated at the time. But with the guardianship, because it goes to the probate court, if it's for the person, they need to file their final um, information for that to, to wrap up that guardianship. And also for the financial, they need to do a final accounting to show where, where the remaining money went. There could be money left over. If there's money left over, then that would go through the estate. And that has to be turned into the court to show where everything is gone and also filing a death certificate with them. Um, we actually had a file we wanted to open an estate on and we couldn't because there was a guardianship still pending and that guardian had not filed their final accounting yet. So we didn't know how much money was left in these for the estate until that guardian completed the guardianship by filing the final accounting that case closes and then that money would then move into the estate once we were able to open it. So that um, overall, I mean, we've talked about the types of guardianships that we that we have, the limited, uh, for limited time for specific person, for day-to-day -day decisions, estate for financial needs, person and estate uh, for day-to-day -day financial decisions, and then the guardian ad litem basically for litigation or divorces. And again, everything for a guardianship is all appointed through the court, the probate court. Um, and you can, they last for 16 months and you gotta make sure that if the, that it, uh, expires, you might, they have to renew that before you can then give out any information. So that's just kind of a recap in regards to guardianships and, and things that you need to watch for. All right, Matt, a little recap on uh, powers of attorney before we have another question here for you. Yeah, absolutely. So, so like we talked about in general, 
uh, powers of attorney have to be signed and notarized. Uh, Witness for medical, uh, that principal is going to need to be 18 years or older, and they're going to have to have the capacity to sign at the time it was signed. Uh, when you're presented with a power of attorney, uh, you're going to want to note uh, those key uh, items that we discussed before, but specifically when it was signed, who the agent is, uh, and who the ex successor agent may be, uh, and what authority is given, uh, and what authority is specifically not given. Um, the, those are going to be your key questions to know and to have at the ready, um, you know, whenever you're you're presented with a power of attorney, uh, just to be sure you're you're uh, uh, authorized in proceeding on the on the basis of those agents' directions. So uh, uh, I'm seeing here we have a, a slew of questions coming in right at the end, and I, out of respect for everyone's time, there was a question asked earlier. I'm going to ask you, Matt, and then the others. Um, Respectfully, we're going to capture those. We'll get answers and we'll send them back to you individually. Um, as a reminder, you will be receiving a copy of the presentation and uh, a recording of today's um, webinar. Um, one last question, Matt. Can you touch on hot powers? Hot powers of powers of attorney. Familiar with that one? I, I was not. So it was a question. Yeah, asked that, that's not a term I'm immediately familiar with. You said hot powers. Yes. Yeah, that's not something I'm I'm too familiar with. I'd have to I'd have to look into that a little bit and and get back to you on that. Yeah, I I wasn't as either, so um, I just wanted to make sure that we I brought it up just in case. But we'll we'll dig into it and get back to it. And if the individual who asked that has some follow up to that, they could send that too. Um, For sure. Yeah. So you know, as a recap, just thank you very much. Really appreciated spending the last hour with everybody. Um, I apologize we're not going to get to the this slew of questions that came in here towards the end, but as I promised, we will get you the answers. Um, please, uh, you know, there is a survey that's going to come up. Uh, we really appreciate the feedback. If you have topics you'd like for uh, the firm to talk about, um, I know many of you have been on multiple um, presentations for us, so we appreciate that. And um, again, yes, there is going to be a question regarding uh, reviewing your documents and procedures. Be happy to have that conversation. Just let us know who's interested. Uh, other than that, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and taking the uh, taking the time today for us. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thanks everybody.